great thank you okay so now i'm just going to introduce mark who for most of you will need no introduction but he's an internationally renowned botanist and he's a well-known public speaker he's our the lnhs's vascular plants recorder and he's also middlesex county recorder for the bsbi he worked for many years at the Natural History Museum. He's currently working as a, as in a variety of roles, including working as a forensic botanist. And he's written a book about those particular experiences, which is well worth reading. He's the honorary curator of, the, of herbariums at the Linnaean Society. He's involved with a wide range of project, projects, citizen science projects. Um, he's an experienced trainer. And he's also leading the London Flora Project. So I'm going to hand you over to Mark Spencer now for his talk, Acid Grasslands and Heats. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. She says, hopefully. Okay. You're all good? Thank I wonder, you. Yes, so, sorry. I'm, I'm going to, have you, is your screen showing okay? Because I've still got my screen. Yes, I am. Okay, I'm I'm just going to click something and it might stop you sharing. So sorry about that if it does. I think it's because we were both sharing at the same time. Okay. Okay. That would have been my fault. Apologies. <laughs> I was getting overexcited. I've unshared <laughs> you, my moment. You jumped in, yeah. Okay, yeah, sorry. I had to stop them both at once. So if you share now, okay. it should be fine. Okay. Apologies for that. The joys of technology we still don't quite get used to this so good evening everybody this is the second in a series of talks about the the main habitat and wildlife and types of the london area um dealing with you know some of our wonderful landscapes and environments in and around the city of london so oh ah ah there we go um, so you may remember if you were at the talk last time that I showed you briefly at the start um, a map sort of laying out London in the context of the nearby areas of South East England. Greater London, as we now know it, is this red line all around here, which my cursor is following around. The original city of London is nestled in this little area here and almost in the middle. The London Natural History Society's area of interest and area of recording extends outside of Greater London into what we refer to as the LNHS polygon, or as it's represented here, a large circle. And you can see that these overlap other existing ways of recording, and these are the vice counties, as they're known, of um, Britain and Ireland. And this is a system that's been in existence since the mid 19th century, devised by a man called Hewitt Cottrell Watson. So I am the vice county recorder for Middlesex, which is this just bit here. This is Surrey VC 17, and this is West Kent VC 16. And here are the Sorry, other vice counties. Are. Before um, so that's just to introduce you to the kind of main geographic areas around the Greater London area um, and also to talk about the organisations whose data I will be presenting. Um, the London Natural History Society collects its own data, which it then deposits in a wide range of national schemes, including the Botanical Society of Britain and Ireland, but also other recording schemes all around the country. And we also deposit our data with our regional biological record centre, Giggle. So it's quite a complicated scenario that we manage with the information flow about London's biodiversity. And I sit on a, a data set of many, many hundreds of thousands of plant records collected over the region over the last 350 or 400 years or so. So without much of ado, let's head into talking about the habitats of the region. Um, and the first thing I'm going to talk to you about is about acid grasslands, because these are often referred to, quite often talked about in the London area, because they are important habitats. They're often referred to as biodiversity action plan habitats in this country. This means they are of national importance for biodiversity. And various parts of Britain and Ireland have important populations or communities rather of acid grassland. Um, 
they are often described as being relatively species poor, um, which is an interesting, probably in many cases, reflection of the history, certainly in Southeast England, and about the activities of humanities, because in many cases, acid grasslands are not that species poor plant-wise. Um, see, grasslands, as you can imagine, grow in environments where the soil conditions err towards acidity. They can be wet, they can be dry, they can be shady, or they can be sunny and open in aspects such as this location here. This is a place in Warren Farm in the west of London. And the reason I have this particular location, up because this is a regional cause celebra in the moment in the London area, this is a place that we are fighting hard to save because amongst other things it's an important area for skylarks to breed in and it also has a very diverse and rather fine assemblage of invertebrates because one thing particularly acid grasslands that are in open sunny habitats have is this reputation for being very very good for quite a wide range of insects such as bees, beetles and butterflies and various other small inverts. So acid grasslands are nationally important habitats and regionally within the Greater London and adjoining area, they are also very, very important and they are scarce, sadly. Now, the reason I've got Warren Farmer is because this exemplifies in many ways what London's current stock of acid grassland looks like, which is frankly a landscape that has seen a lot of hard life in the last 150 years. So it has characteristics of a acid or slightly acidic or weakly neutral sort of environment and soils in that most of the grasses here are grostis. Bents are a common grassland composition of, of these habitats, in many species in the genus of grostis. However, you'll also notice in the background there's a, a taller grass here. This is Aranathrum elatius, the false oat grass. And false oat grass tends to grow in environments which are a little bit more nutrient enriched and quite often being disturbed. So what I'm showing you here is an acid grassland that has frankly taken a bit of a kicking over the last hundred years and quite literally so in this particular case because for several decades this was used as a sports field. The local community are fighting hard now to preserve it as an open grassland landscape which is incredibly important because we really don't want the trees upon this rare commodity. So as the grasslands have got this reputation for being species poor but that is in many ways because actually many of our acid grasslands in the London area have lost a lot of species um, through the activities of humanity over the last 150 years or so. So if I just move on to the next slide, to do exemplify this, this disturbance that we often find in acid grassland habitats. Here we have another rather marvellous wild British plant. This is common spear thistle, Circium vulgari very, very important for invertebrates. And there's yarrow here in the background. And yarrow itself is more indicative of acid to neutral grasslands habitats. It also grows in quite chalky soils as well. Whereas the thistle is definitely telling a tale of quite a lot of impact by humanity and also quite heavy horse grazing in the past in this particular site. Nevertheless, it is a jumping with wildlife and very, very important site that is worth looking after and restoring. And it also has other plants in it which are quite often not nationally noted or really considered to be key to what an acid grassland is. They're not always used as the main indicators of acid grassland. Um, species that are highly indicative we refer to as indicators or axiophytes. And this lovely yellow fluffy thing in front of us is Gallium verum, ladies bed straw. Now, Gallium verum is a plant which can exist in soils which are quite strongly calcareous, quite chalky or limestoney, in quite neutral soils, and also in fairly acidic soils. But the thing that ladies bed straw needs is nutrient poor environments. It cannot cope with an environment where there's lots of fertilizer, lots of nitrogen, and then 
ultimately, if things get out of hand, lots of competition from things like this false oak grass here in the corner. So in many cases, we find that acid grassland habitats and chalk grassland habitats, which we'll be talking about at another point in this series, are environments of low nutrient. And this is one of the great challenges for our grasslands and our woodland habitats, as I mentioned last, uh, two weeks ago, is that actually these habitats are quite negatively impacted by air pollution, aircraft, vehicles, etc., depositing nitrogen in the form of nitrogen dioxide into the air and more localised pollution in, frankly, large quantities of dog poo from dog walkers. So these habitats face quite a considerable amount of threats potentially from pollution and other threats such as really not very well thought through tree planting. Now this exemplifies a species which straddles this, this barrier so to speak of being a plant of calcareous soils and of acidic soils. This is Campanula rotundifolia, our harebell, and this is one of our most celebrated um, wild plants, member of the Campanulaceae. Um, and, you know, this is a really, really beautiful plant, which is sadly much, much diminished across much of southeast England and is actually potentially at risk of extinction in England. This particular map is probably overemphasizing, and this is taken from the BSBI data that I mentioned earlier on, overemphasizing the abundance of this species in the London area because these large dots, as I mentioned last time, are not saying this plant is spread all over that chunk of land, but there may well be, if we drilled down and came down from space, literally one or two plants in that vicinity. Oops, I just splashed water over my glasses, apologies. <clears throat> and this exemplifies one of the problems for many of these plants and these habitats that you might have from what looks like a healthy population of this species, but when you get down to it and look at a site, there might be one or only two clones surviving in there. So these, these populations of these plants are in many ways what we refer to living under the threat of an extinction debt. Whilst they persist there in these broken up small habitats, they ultimately do risk extinction because there's not enough individuals in the population to keep the population going. The Campanula rotundifolia has got this problem and also this intolerance of pollution to deal with and loss of habitat through some of the things that I've mentioned. Now, <clears throat> this slide I've used many, many times over the years, but it exemplifies one of the wonders of London's natural history and the peculiarities of the English national character, I suppose, which is our great enthusiasm for documenting and recording um, natural history and wild plants and wild animals, um, and fungi for that matter. Um, and this is from the celebrated Gerard's Herbal. This, this is one of the first works that talks about and makes reference to wild plants in Britain. There are earlier publications, but I put this one up because it's, um, it's well known. But it's also because it was edited by a man called Thomas Johnson. Thomas Johnson edited the second edition, which is frankly much better than the first edition, and knocked it into shape because he was a very, very good botanist, sadly killed shortly afterwards in the Civil War. Now, Thomas Johnson is very interesting chap, and one of the things that he is famous for in the botanical world is that he and his friends um, partook in the first documented and recording activity of botanizing, going out into the environment and looking around and squirreling around and looking for plants. And he published this um, short pamphlet called Ericetum Hamsteadianum Suplantarum Idicrescentium Observatio Habito Anno Idium, first of all, 1629. Um, and as you can look with a little bit of Latin, you can see that Ericetum refers to heather, Hamsteadianum re refers to the area of what is now well and truly within North London, the Hampstead area. And Hampstead Heath, as what he's referring to here, has got one of the longest recorded histories of documentation of wildlife of anywhere in the world. So we're very, very lucky that we've got an incredibly rich 
data series of change in our environment. And it's fair to say the vicissitudes of the last 350 or 400 years rather have resulted in a Hampstead Heath, which is more or less no longer Heathland. Much of the area that was once upon a time open landscape is now wooded. Um, and some of the most of the remaining areas of open areas are quite um, heavily utilised grassland and amenity grassland, as we call it, mown grassland. There are some very small areas of heavily tended um, heathland with, with some of the remaining species on, such as this plant that's depicted here, which is Erica cinerea, the bell heather. And this is one of our British native heather species. Now, <clears throat> just going to move, this silly thing keeps getting in the way. One of the things I want to now talk about today is talk a little bit more about mapping and how we can understand not only the distribution of plants, but also of ecosystems. So acid grasslands and heathlands actually in many ways segue and flow into each other because essentially they are both ecosystems of nutrient poor environments and they're both ecosystems that um, that err in the acidic realm rather. They also tend to be, or ideally they are, open habitats. As a consequence, we can find if things are going to plan and everything's well, that these habitats will flow into each other and you will find acid grassland in association with heathland, which is largely denoted by the primary presence of these plants, heather, bell heather and crossleaf heather, and other short shrubs, such as the gorses and some of their relatives, the genistas, the winds, which I'll be talking about momentarily in a bit. So one of the things you can do if you're trying to identify areas, in this case in the Greater London area, is essentially do what's called coincidence mapping, which is map the individual species and then actually lay the data on top to find where they all come together. And in this particular map, what I've done is exactly that. I've pulled out the data for these three species for the London and adjoining area, stacked them on top, and the darker the green blobs, the more species and the more records there are. And so from this you can tell, and this data is from 1990, so we're talking about pretty much what survives in the London area, not what was here. 400 years ago. So you can see straight away that in the in the southwest down here there's quite a rich abundance and quite a large quantity relatively speaking or indicated by these dots of this type of habitat where heather's present. This is as I remind you is the boundary of Greater London. This area down here for people who are not familiar with the London's geography is an incredibly important area. This is the London Borough of Richmond, um, and it is historically and culturally an incredibly important and beautiful part of our city, but it also has some of our most important surviving ancient landscapes. In particular, Richmond Park is a very, very large area of an internationally important acid grassland with small areas of heath community, and many, many fine ancient veteran trees, as I mentioned a couple of weeks ago. So the areas around Richmond Park and adjoining pieces of landscape are a hub for these acid grassland and heathland plants. We've got other areas further south, just south of Croydon, and this area in Kent, in what was formerly Kent in Orpington. Up to the northeast, we have again the internationally important and famous Epping Forest area, which runs in a sort of lozenge through here, which you'll see in a bit more clearly in another map. Then we have some outliers up here on the, on the edge of the city. And this is on the slope going up into this region here around Watford, which is actually chalk. This is a chalky calcareous environment, but there's areas of more acidic soil before it translates or transfers into um, chalk coming to the surface. And there are one or two other important areas which I'm going to mention. This is an area called Hounslow Heath, which I'll refer to a little bit later on. And here's Hampstead. Hampstead area has still got some of these species, 
hanging on just about through the activities of volunteer communities and the City of London Corporation looking after this landscape. One or two of these other dots are, for example, just here. Uh, that's uh, actually the Natural History Museum Wildlife Garden, but there's also a tiny surviving population of heather in nearby Kensington Gardens. So you can see from this map, remember this is overemphasized, that actually the area that is suitable or still has heather and heathland and, and these kinds of communities growing in the Greater London area is actually very limited relative to the size of our whole city. Um, now, so I'm aware of the fact that we have people from overseas looking on, and probably you may or may not have seen a, a Heathland before or a British Heathland. Um, many parts of the world have ecologically analogous landscapes um, with short dwarf shrubs, um, and quite often these are shrubs which can be also in quite Mediterranean environments. Southern Africa is a very important area that is super rich in heath communities and many other parts of the world, as they say, has, have habitats which have comparable characteristics in terms of their ecosystem. This particular area exemplifies a heathland in the London area which is gradually transitioning. This is actually Wimbledon Common in southwest London, not far from that area in Richmond that I mentioned. And you can see in the front here, as you can imagine, this is the depths of winter. This is Kaluna, this is the main most widespread heather species in this part of Britain with silver birch, Betula pendula. Now Betula pendula is a very very important tree over much of Britain and Ireland and much of the northern hemisphere frankly because it is an important early colonist species that gets into new landscape when the opportunity arises and here we have one of our two native oak species. Now this landscape, this tells me straight away that this is a heathland which is gradually, or has been broadly speaking for much of the last 200 years or so, gradually transitioning to more of a closed woodland habitat. Um, and this is true of many of our heathland habitats in the London area. We are really struggling because of lack of resources and other complexities about landscape management in our city to maintain them as the open ecosystems which are for what, for what they're incredibly important. So this is a young oak, this is probably only 50 or 60 years old, maybe slightly less, which is quite hard to judge from it, and this birch is probably slightly less, say 30 or 40. So this is a landscape which might look as if it's sitting still, but there's actually significant change. Down here underneath this oak tree, this very straw-coloured grassy material, is the overwintering foliage of purple moor grass, Malinia carulia. Now, Malinia carulia is nationally in the north and west of Britain and also in Ireland, a very, very abundant and widespread species on our moorland areas. In southeast England, it is less common, and in the greater London areas, you can see it is of very, very limited extent. So Wimbledon Common is this bit more or less just down here. And as I said, it's Hampstead Heath once or more. So these nationally widespread plants are pretty scarce in our city. <clears throat> now, I'm going to sort of drill in a little bit more into how we can explore where our seed grasslands exist in London and also actually give you an indication of where we have lost them from. So I have two, one map here and an image for two members of the dock family. On the left here, this is Fiddle Dock Rumex Pulcher. Um, it's actually um, quite, it's not a brilliant picture, it's actually quite a cute little dock, I rather like it. It is, has quite a distinctive growth form which makes it very easy to identify. Um, and this is a species which is scattered across many parts of London and um, does seem to possibly be coming a little bit more common for reasons which I'll go into in a moment. Now the map on the right hand side is for sheep sorrel, not for the, for the fiddle dog. Well. Now you can see from this that the sheep sorrel is one of the species which is nationally used as being a key indicator for acid grassland. It's one of the main things that go, ah, sheep sorrel, acid grassland. Now, 
you look at this map, you can see that the distribution of sheet star or shorel is considerably wider than the distribution of the heathers that I showed you a moment ago. Now, what I think this is essentially showing us is that actually the sheep sorrel has the ability to be able to survive in environmental conditions where things like the heathers and other more specialist and ecologically fussy, frankly, plant species have been unable this. So what you're seeing here in this wide scattered distribution is to a certain extent, potentially, the former distribution of acid grassland and heathland type habitats over much of the London area. Because sheep sorrel is a quite small plant and it is highly tolerant of being mown. So you can quite often find it, if you look around in your patient, in apparently quite dull grassland. So sheep sorrel is probably giving us an indication of the ghosts of ecosystems past, and that's similar case with the story with fiddle dog. Fiddle dog had, turns up in places like central London on weedy roadside verges, which probably there were tiny residual populations from habitats and ecosystems that we disturbed and broke up over the, over the last 300 years or so. <clears throat> now, just to sort of give it a little bit more sort of oomph and structure, I played around with the, the data and did it with another a group of plants. So again, Rumex acetazella, sheep sorrel, that was the map I just showed you a moment ago, but to which I added Tormentil, another key indicator species, Potentilla erecta, Heath bed straw, which is a white relative of ladies' bed straw, but tends to be much, much shorter and is largely restricted, almost entirely restricted to acid bee, and wavy hair grass. And overlaid the data for all of these, and you can see once more that actually you've got these strong aggregations of acid grassland or surviving acid grassland habitats in parts of London. Again, this strong band in the southwest of the London area, further south down here, the Epping Forest area, that little nodule in the Hampstead area, and then this arc to the north and some scatterings in the west here, which actually relate in part to Heathrow Airport is just about there. So, this indication, when you put these plants together, a stronger indication of where our surviving acid grassland resource is likely to be. Similarly, when we were talking about oak tree, about woodlands and forests the last two weeks ago, I talked about Quercus potraea, the less frequent of our two oak species in the London area, or a native oak species rather. And again, you can see this pattern that I mentioned before, being picked up. Here's the band in the northwest, there's the Hampstead area, and once more the other sites in the south. Now I wanted to just put this tree image up of this portrait of this up for a moment because Quercus Petraea is a locally common tree in the London area, but it's probably under-recorded. So for you London botanists, just a quick reminder, if you're not sure, what you have to look at is the leaf stalk, the petiole, the leaf stalk in Petraea is quite long, whereas Quercus roba, it's tiny, 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 or should be. Quercus roba has at the base of the leaf blade quite strong earlobe like structures that come out, whereas in Petraea, the leaf base is more or less like that. It is cuneate. And then finally, and I'm doing this very, very quickly, the acorns of Quercus Petraea are held right onto the twig whereas in the other species, Roba, they're on a little stalk. So a quick reminder for you all about how to identify these two species. Now returning to uh, the ghosts and the gradually diminishing acid grasslands and heathland plants of the London area, I'm just going to sort of run through some interesting plant groups and talk about them a little bit. And I'm going to dwell a little bit on them to the pea family because the pea family are famous for their great beauty and their importance economically, and also for their ability to use rhizobium back bacteria in their roots, in their root nodules, to synthesize nitrogen and enable them to thrive. 
This gives them a competitive advantage in many areas, and it also gives them the ability to survive in many cases in nutrient poor soils. Now Dyer's greenweed is a species which is massively diminished in abundance in the London area um, and it's a species which is quite interesting because a bit like ladies bed straw it sort of crosses the boundary from being sort of somewhat acidic loving into neutral to even slightly chalky but the distribution of this species is quite heavily associated with remnant pieces of neutral to acidic grassland. So for example, this down here is Hounslow Heath. And I'll talk about Hounslow Heath quite a lot in a bit, but this was one of the most important and greatest pieces of lowland heath anywhere in Britain and Ireland um, that we have now tragically lost because of urbanisation and land changes over the last 300 years. In many ways, it was as fine as the wonderful heathland and acid grassland habitats of the New Forest. So this is a plant which is gradually diminishing. It is a species which just simply cannot adapt to new landscape management and change and is becoming very, very rare in London indeed. Other member of the pea family that is a short shrubby plant because actually it doesn't look like it but Dyer's greenweed is a very very short shrub. It tends to grow up and down but it is essentially quite woody at its base and this is a characteristic which ecosystem wise in the London area doesn't work very well in the modern world. If you're a short shrub and you can't cope with being mown but you also can't compete with other bigger, larger trees and shrubs, as we're finding in the many parts of it, you tend to die out. So this is another reason why the, um, the Dyer's Greenweed and Ulex Minor, one of our native um, gorses, one of our three native gorses in Britain, has become much, much rarer. And once more, there's Hounslow Heath, the Richmond area around Richmond Park, and good old Hampstead Heath retaining just about some of these plants that indicate its former environment. Now, continuing in the realm of clovers and or rather members of the pea family, I'm going to talk about clovers. Um, the genus Trifolium and it related or allied genera are some of our most beautiful and ecologically wild plants. Many of them are incredibly important for a wide range of invertebrates. Quite a lot of them are quite rufty tufty adaptable plants that you find in arable circle in agricultural circumstances such as white clover which is in fact is an invasive species in other parts of the world and um, things like red clover trifolium pratensi. We also have a cohort of much much rarer and much much more vulnerable and ecologically and fragile species which are essentially associated with acid environments and acid soils in the London area. And again, if you were to look at the past distribution of the past records of these plants, many of these plants were referred to as being locally common or frequent in some of the floras that covered the London area 200 years ago. So once more, we have this pattern that you see, but actually you can see these clovers doing really, really bad, badly in the northern part of London they're still doing pretty well in the southwest and in the far east on the Thames Gateway where there is quite a bit of suitable open nutrient poor habitat surviving and various parts of southeast London including somewhere down here, I just forget exactly where, a very very important site Black Heath which I will talk about in a moment. Most of these plants are annuals or short perennial species. Most of them only grow a few inches, so they are highly reliant upon an ecosystem management which allows them to flower and fruit and produce seeds each year. Mowing too hard, mowing too early in many cases for quite a few species can result in populations being either lost or severely damaged and impacted. And that's actually what happened on quite a few of these sites. So what do they look like? They're lovely little things. Um, now, one of the ones, I'm, I'm not going to go through all of them because there are quite a few small clovers 
in, in, in Britain. If you go into the Mediterranean, there's many, many more. Now, this particular one up here, Trifilium scabrum, is not in this particular mapping system because, as far as we know at the moment, it's only in one place just here, and that is Warren Farm that I mentioned at the beginning. This site that we're doing our best to try and save. Trifolium scabrum is extremely rare in the London area. It is probably, there might be other locations, as far as we know, more or less the only site, certainly north of the Thames, for this species. This is a photograph of it, actually not from um, the London area. I photographed this in Wales. It is a low growing small annual clover that has very hairy stems and these strongly star-like reflexed out calices. The species which is fairly frequent in some of the areas I mentioned is this one, Trifolium striatum, this rather attractive little pink species, and it makes up quite a few of the dots in the map above. And then in the middle, we have rather extraordinary Trifolium subterranean, which has a rather extraordinary ecological adaptation compared to these other species. These other species produce small pea pods that are then liberated into the environment. Trifolium subterranean does a very, very clever thing. Once the flower has been pollinated and the seed has been fertilized, the flower head pushes down into the ground, a bit like grappling hooks, the calyx expands, and it locks the plant into the ground and the seeds stay in the ground. A bit like, for those of you who are familiar, a bit like um, peanut. So it has a very, very unusual ecological adaptation, which very, very few British plants have. A couple more rather delightful small clovers. Um, this one here on the left is Trifolium glomeratum, and this is locally frequent in parts of the southeast of the London area. The most important site that I'm aware for it overall is the um, wonderful area of Blackheath. Now, Blackheath, if you looked at the records in the 18th and 19th century, was one of the great places for looking for some of these acid grassland and heathland type plants. Then through the 20th century, it became mown almost into oblivion. It was like a bowling green. Local communities, and, and as a consequence, most of the plant records from this area vanished, and many of these small clovers, such as glomeratum, were believed to have become extinct. Um, thankfully, the man management has largely changed over large areas of the site. Parts of the grasslands are left to actually grow for several months through the year. And this species, Trifolium glomeratum, has rebounded in huge numbers where the habitat would allow, which is wonderful news because it really is rather an uncommon plant nationally. And we've had this extraordinary non-native introduction or adventive, we don't know how it got in, this is the woolly clover, Trifolium tomentosum, which grows in one part of the Blackheath area. We have absolutely no idea how it got into, um, into the area, and as far as I'm aware, it's the only stable population of this extraordinary Mediterranean plant in Britain and Ireland. And then, I think pretty much last but not least, this cute little Last member, clover relative, this is the bird's foot or Nithocephalus. Somebody needs to turn off there. Thank you. Oh, gosh, that was loud. So, this is an interesting plant because, unlike the others which have got trifoliate leaves, it has leaves that are arranged in a little ladder. Uh, but this is tiny. These flowers are only two or three millimeters across. It's a very, very small plant but it's locally frequent in suitable acid grasslands in Richmond area and is well worth looking for in old lawns, in churchyards, in various parts of the London area, So, because it is under-recorded. Nevertheless, it is still uncommon. Now I'm going to talk about wet heaths and wet acid grasslands for a while and come back to um, talking momentarily about Hounslow Heath. Now Hounslow Heath still exists, it's a nature reserve, and it retains some very, very regionally important plants in there. Um, it's very small, um, it's probably, I think off the top of my head, it's a few hectares, 
uh, much, much smaller than its original size, which was absolutely massive. I can't remember the exact extent of it. So it's a much diminished area in size and lost a lot of its ecosystem structure. It has lost many, many species because of that. Some of the heathers still remain there and some of the other species persist, such as the genistas, but a lot of other species have gone. And as I say, if you look at the records for Hounslow Heath in the 18th and 19th century, the list of plants, which are now nationally incredibly rare or on the brink of extinction that used to grow in Hampstead Heath is actually extraordinary. So some of you may have heard of a plant called Damazonian star fruit. This is a plant which is critically endangered in Britain. It is critically endangered, in fact, over most of its world range, which is Western Europe. Very, very rare plant indeed, really, really struggling to survive in the modern world. It used to grow on Hampstead, on, on Hounslow Heath. And there are many, many other species like that, including this delightful thing, pillwort, pillularia. This is a specialist of wet, boggy, acid um, grassland communities and damp, open bits on the edges of ponds. Um, this is a Western European endemic. I think it may also occur in parts of North Africa. Again, across Europe is world range. This is really quite seriously at risk of extinction. The UK and Ireland has large chunks of the global population, but this is a species which used to occur at Hampstead Heath that is sadly no longer existent. These are ferns. These are actually the little spore bodies here. Hence the name pillwort, these little round structures, an absolutely extraordinary little plant. Similarly, the lesser marsh wort, Apium inundatum, was another species that was recorded there. This is now largely wiped out from much of southeast England, it occurs in some of the Surrey heaths, um, and is a close relative of creeping marsh wort, Apium repens, that some of you may have heard of. This is a plant which I photographed in Cornwall, where it is still locally quite frequent. So this is a relative of your celery. And you can see that rather unusually for members of the carrot family in this country, the foliage is strongly dimorphic or polymorphic, frankly, because you can see this is the aerial foliage. There are the little carrot flowers. That is the foliage of the same plant underwater. So the underwater foliage is different to the aerial foliage in this particular species. Naughty me, I didn't change that. That should not say bird's foot. I was typing very quickly. This is Marsh, uh, Marsh St. John's word, Hypericum elodes. This is a highly distinctive specialist Hypericum of wet, boggy habitats. It forms low domes and mats, sadly lost for much of the London area. You can see here, this is a photograph from Cornwall, there's the parent plant and these rhizomes running out over the mud to create a larger patch. Beautiful, beautiful little plant indeed. Other losses from the London area or things that are hanging on just by the skin of the teeth nearby in Surrey are pale violet and lesser skullcap. Both of these species were recorded and actually referred to in the deep distant past as being locally frequent in places such as Hounslow Heath 200 plus years ago. This plant, Viola lactaria, is now a very scarce plant over much of southern England with really rather small populations surviving in the New Forest area, Dorset, Devon and Cornwall. Lesser skullcap is are doing rather better and is rather more widespread, but both of these species like many of the other plants I've mentioned today, are poor competitors when you put lots of nitrogen into the environment. They simply die out. Going from wet, I'm going to turn to dry to talk, mentioned just momentarily, another species which, like um, earlier on, the latest bed straw is a species which can sort of move across from acidic soils into more calcareous soils, although it tends to be in more nutrient poor acidic soils, and this is wild thyme. This is still an abundant plant in coastal areas and in chalk and limestone grass in land areas over much of Britain and Ireland, but is now extremely uncommon in much of the London area where it used to persist. So this is a wild relative of the 
thyme that you have in your mixed herb bag on your shelf at home. The genus thymus in, is, originates largely in the Mediterranean, the Eastern Med, where it is incredibly large and complicated. We've only got three species growing in England, um, and they we grumble about those being tricky at times. Other species um, which we have just about hanging in the London area are kind of interesting because in other parts of the country they have a, a different sort of habitat requirement, particularly the plant on the right. So sawwort here on the left is a relative of knapweeds and thistles, as you can see from its flower, it's quite thistly looking. And this is a plant which is largely found in ancient species rich grassland again that spurs towards neutral but will be found in acidic environments and habitats. It is a plant of largely open grassland habitats over much of Britain and Ireland. Sawwer, sorry not not sawwer, not in solidago just here on the right, goldenrod, this is another member of the daisy family, is a plant which if you go to the west of England, go to Cornwall once more, a place I great love greatly, this is a plant of open coastal habitats, edges of quarries, edges of acid, acid grassland where it's not being grazed out by sheep. In the London area, it is almost entirely now restricted to the edges of ancient woodlands um, and is very, very small in number in those places, largely because of the wider landscape that it once occupied has now been lost. Other plants which are nationally pretty abundant, which we are now extremely rare in the London area, are such things as betony, Botonica officinalis. Um, this is a plant which we have very, very few surviving populations in the London area. Unfortunately, its wild distribution has been slightly blurred by the presence of people planting it here and there in places such as Queen Elizabeth Park in the Lower River Lee. Um, and not making a document or not notification, so to speak, of the fact that this is planted material. And this is one of the great challenges of botanising in London area and actually looking at the wild plants and understanding their patterns of change. If people don't tell you what they've done, it can be very, very hard to interpret what's, um, what survives and how things are doing. Heath spotted orchid, this is one of Britain's native orchids. So for those of you who are not um, from the UK or Ireland, you might be surprised to hear that we have orchids here. We have about 50 plus species, um, so not vast compared to somewhere like Colombia, um, where there are thousands and thousands and thousands, but we do have a few. Um, this is one of the relatively small number that grows in acidic or largely acidic soil conditions. Um, and is very, very common and widespread in much of the Western Britain and Ireland, um, but is pretty uncommon over much of Southeast England, and especially so in the London area, where we really are facing the potential loss of this species over the next two decades or so. It's a very, very low numbers now. Now, there's weirdly some strange things been happening on London streets of late. Here I've got two plants which are part of the cudweed group. These are members of the daisy family. Uh, and cudweeds are um, kind of cute but somewhat drab looking plants. They've got silvery grey foliage and tend to have these little tiny flower heads. Ecologically they evolved in the Mediterranean type environment. That's why they have the silvery foliage because it helps reflect sunlight off. They are essentially annuals and plants of very very short um, turf and grassland ecosystems. They need open habitats. The one on the left, Nephalium uliginosum, meaning marshy, the marsh cudweed, is the much, much more common nationally and is actually locally very, very abundant, almost to the point of being weedy in some places on the edges of fields and such like. Whereas common cudweed, poorly named, is not a common species, but both of these species were historically strongly associated with acid grasslands, wet ones in this case, or dry ones in this case. They have largely been lost from these habitats in the London area, apart from one or two places, but they have adapted. So we're now starting to find these and their relative species 
turn up on street corners in the London area. So they're adapting to a new way of life, living in a new ecosystem as street plants in our city. And then finally, I didn't put any animals in this time, naughty neighbor there. Plants are quite fun. Uh, just to finish off on a story about a fungus. This is uh, the nail fungus, Peronia punctata. Now, if I'd have been talking to you about this species 30 to 40 years ago, I would have been telling you that this was on the brink of extinction across much of the west of Western Europe, um, where it's, it's most of its world ranges, um, because of changes in the environment. Because this is a very, very specialist fungus. Nail fungus only lives on horse poo and nothing else. There's one other related species in Britain which lives only on rabbit poo, which is extremely rare. Nail, nail fungus is, was very, very rare. It used to be in the 17th, 18th, 19th century, quite a common fungus growing on the edges of dung heaps and fields because of the large number of horses in our environment, used for transport, etc., etc. After the significant changes of the 20th century and the automobile taking over, the numbers of this fungus and horses dropped. But then modern veterinary world came into play as well, and horses were fed increasingly more and more antibiotics, which rendered the stomach, the gut contents of the um, horse and the poo that came out of the end essentially toxic for this fungi. And it vanished over vast swathes of Western Europe to the point where it was more or less extinct, hanging on in one or two places in the New Forest, Exmoor, and a few places in southern France and Spain. It became extremely rare. Anyway, about now 15 years ago, I was telling a friend of mine this very story and telling them about how um, this plant, this fungus that was associated with heathlands had become incredible and, and gra poor grasslands had vanished. About, and the last record was over 100 years ago for the London area. About an hour and a half later, he was talking to me. He looked down and knelt down and picked up a horse poo and went, is that it? And we just found nail fungus for the first time in over 100 years in the London area. It has now become more, I mean, still very, very rare but it is gradually becoming more frequent as conservation grazing, use of conics and other small breeds is becoming more, more widespread in landscape management. Why is it called a nail fungus? Punctata refers to these little dots all over the surface. It's because you can't see it from this side, but it looks like an old fashioned flat headed nail. So that's the, the nail fungus. And on that note, I'll finish. Thank you very much. Good night. We'll have questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mark. That was uh, what a great story to finish on. That's just amazing, isn't it? The kind of coincidence of that. It's fantastic. And I, I love the kind of survey that you gave and the way you kind of told us the stories about different species, some interesting things happening, obviously around things like the cudweeds. That's an interesting sort of shift from kind of one habitat to another. And I liked the, I thought the maps that you were showing, the, 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 the where you talked about the sort of ghosts of acid grass and heath and I think that's that was kind of fascinating to me and the layering of the maps so you kind of see the concentration so it's, you know it was just full of really interesting ideas and there's plenty of questions been coming through so um, I'm conscious we haven't got a great deal of time so let's get straight over to those um, Anka are you all right to pick up the first kind of questions from the chat? Yeah I'll just um, some of them I think are going to require a lot more discussion so I'm just going to ask some that might not take so much um, since we're such limited time. So Robin was asking, what is the effect of hotter summers on acid grasslands in London? Obviously risk of fires, but are droughts restricting growth, restricting growth a good thing or a bad thing? It's probably going to be a bad thing because these are plants of, of open habitats, but they've evolved in a relatively cool part of the world these plants are not going to be able to tolerate having their, their upper bits burnt off and their root systems burnt year in, year out. So they're probably going to really suffer and struggle. Um, and we're also going to see ultimately probably if they start to struggle, even more carbon dioxide released into the atmosphere because their root systems will get weaker. And most of the carbon dioxide 
in grasslands, carbon rather, is in the roots, not in the aerial bits. So probably not good. Right. Um, another shorter question, I hope. Um, are there mire systems in London's heaths or ghosts of where they were once there or were they never there? That's from Sue. That's a really good question. Um, they were there. So um, Hounslow Heath in particular had quite a lot of mire. We don't know the detailed structure of it because it was almost entirely wiped out by the middle of the 19th century, if not earlier. One of the things that is characterises much of the London area is actually as well as urbanising, we have drained. Mm. So, uh, yeah, the, 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 if you probably did a more detailed mapping of some of the moist requiring species, moisture requiring species, such as Hypericum melodies and other plants associated with, you know, bogs and mires, you would get an understanding. I didn't talk about, for example, sphagnum, which is pretty much on a life support system in Greater London. There are tiny, tiny patches in Greater London. There are more extensive areas when, when you get out into the Surrey Heath area. But yes, essentially we've destroyed most of them. Oh, that's not happy, is it? Um, <laughs> <laughs> climate science. It's, um, Fides was wondering, um, if there was acidic grassland in Northern England, for instance, um, in the Peak District. Yes. So the Peak District is interesting because it's um, the, the underlying rock is a complex series of limestone, calcareous type soils, and then um, acidic rocks like millstone grit and, uh, and others. Um, and so there are extremely large areas of acidic grassland. In many cases, this acidic grassland is frankly overly sheep grazed um, grassland that would have been a more species rich and diverse matrix of heathland and scrub woodland etc cetera, etc cetera. but yeah there are very very extensive areas of, of acid grassland over much of north and west britain of varying degrees of health or damage depending on what we've done to them uh, maria um did you because I've got, there's a few more questions. I don't know how much. I, I was thinking we'd just have a couple more, just a couple of short ones more, and then we probably will wrap up. But I thought it was so interesting. There's so much kind of, you know, though I'd let, I'll let you run on for a couple more questions, but then we will probably wind, need to wind up. Yeah. Okay, there's, um, hmm. Um, Tony was asking, um, how were natural acid grasslands maintained? Um, grazing by large herbivores prehistorically or farming historically? So how were they maintained? Um, well, originally, I mean, we get into the kind of landscape theory um, and there's lots of debate about this across Norway, you know, the theories of Vera and how grazing um, evolved and how that regulated structure of woodlands and open grassland habitats is still hotly debated. But if you look at London's and the adjoining areas, landscapes and environment, you're looking at re areas which have been heavily managed through arable over much of Middlesex. So most of that's gone through arable in the 18th and 19th century and grazing um, for sheep and also for cows. Um, in the earlier period, cows were very important in the vicinity of Greater London because of their supplies of milk. So um, sheep and cows um, were a key and fundamental part for the last 200 years and, and cutting on occasion and occasionally burning as well. So, Anka, if we just take the last question now from the chat. Mm, I'm going to do two. I'm going to do a com combination of two questions. Um, I'm going to sneak one of mine in. Um, what impact do you think tree planting schemes have on the open landscapes here in London? And then kind of related, Andrew asks, what do you think about the reintroduction of known native species in London areas where they no longer grow but once did? Um, tree planting is important. The fundamental aspect of right tree, right place is um, something that is to be debated. Mm. We are largely failing with tree planting in the London area. Much of London area, we don't need to be planting trees. We should be allowing natural regeneration. We are seeing some tree planting organisations actively damage or destroy open grassland habitat, including acid grassland and neutral grassland. Um, and it is a shame and a disgrace. Um, so yes, trees, we do need more trees. 
um, but it is a complicated thing that needs more nuance than just chucking them out when there's a bit of spare corner. Um, on the planting, planting is of, you know, things that are at risk is, is an option, but it's the last option, you know, when populations are so severely damaged that their chances of recovery are very limited, then we should, we need to consider it. You have to bear in mind that with climate change, many populations of things in southeast London, England are probably doomed anyway because of the rate of change that are about to go through. So it's got to be viewed. So I'm not anti restoration ex situ and then planting in, you know, but it should be, you know, the end of the line. And again, it's, uh, um, you know, again, this, this, it's not straightforward. It's something yeah. that needs a lot of thought and consideration. Yeah. Not, there's, not a, there's no easy fix, I think, yeah. to yeah. these issues. So I'm going to, I'm afraid we, I know we could probably talk for another hour, and I'm sure some people would really enjoy that, but I think we're going to have to kind of to wrap, to wrap it up there. But there have been so many messages of thanks and appreciation for your talk coming through the chat, Mark. Um, people really enjoyed it. It was a fascinating talk, beautifully illustrated as well. And I think, yes, it, I'm, I'm glad we've recorded it because I'm going to go back and look at it again because I think there's, you know, enough to take in a whole, like, a, you know, for a second time. So thank you so much again. I mean, really just a wonderful talk. We are so lucky to have you and so lucky to have this series of talks given by you. I'm just going to flag up then the next in Mark's series of talks is going to be on the 21st of April. And next time we're going to be looking at neutral and calcareous grassland. So please do. I know a lot of people signed up for that already, but please do sign up if you'd like to come along for that. We have one talk before that, so in two weeks' time, on the 7th of April, we've got a talk which is in a series of, the, of talks for, about conservation in Jamaica by some local experts that we've got contact with there. So, so that should be, again, really fascinating. So the first in that series is by Ricardo Miller, um, and it's about it's Jamaica hotspot for endemic birds and overwintering migrants. So it should be a fascinating talk with some amazing photographs. So please do sign up for that as well. Come to both. Come to all of our talks. You're most welcome to come along to everything. Thank you very much for joining us again this evening. If you want to unmute yourself um, before you go to say goodbye and thank you to Mark. You're most welcome to do that. And we hope to see you all again very soon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.